I'm Lenny Milner. Um, this is uh, a discussion of the vocabulary in Hansen and Quinn Unit 10, which starts on page 272. The vocabulary continues on to 273, and there's a discussion that goes on for a couple of pages to 275. I'm not going to cover everything that's in the notes. We, you can read them as well, but I'll just uh, give you, make some comments about particular trends in the list. First of all, you have a series of verbs of the type angelo, whose feature is angelo, the first word in the list. Note that there's a circumflex over the omega and a single L in the second principal part, that is the future, as opposed to the double lambdas, angelo versus angelo. The, the convention in Greek dictionaries, and our book conforms with those conventions, is um, when there's a contract verb of the type angelo, and you can tell it's a contract verb because of the circumflex over the omega, you don't explain what it is if uh, it's an epsilon contract. If that were an alpha or an omicron contract, it would be in parentheses, a-o uh -oh, or a-o, uh -oh, okay? Since it's an epsilon contract, there's no notation. So that's a, a, a typical relationship between a verbal stem that ends in a lambda, okay, that's a, a consonant of the class of resonance. Resonance are the consonants in my last name, Milner, M, L, N, and R. And so there are a couple of examples of these verbs in the list of vocabulary words. A little bit farther down, there's kaleo, um, which uh, looks like it ends with a uh, uh, Similarly, a lambda and an epsilon. There was actually another consonant there. But you also have a contract future, which is the same as the contract present. That is, kalo, the second principal part, is an epsilon contract like kalo or kaleo, the present. So there's a change that took place that, that has lost its traces, phonological traces, over time. And it's made these equivalent. In the case of meno, you have a closer analogy to angelo, angelo. You have meno, meno. Again, the stem ends with an n, just like angelo, the stem ends with a lambda, and kaleo. And then you got the uh, epsilon contract verb. So that's a prototype. Um, there are other examples of it. The other principal parts have a relationship, especially of Angelo and Meno to each other, Angela versus Emena for the aorist, Angelka versus uh, uh, Memneka, and so forth. Um, note that, as the book notes, that the, in Angelo, the perfect principal part is Angelka and Angelmai. In other words, you, because the verb begins with a vowel, the way you make a, a reduplication for such a verb is by lengthening it, that is, by augmenting it. So there's no way to tell um, the difference between uh, augmented stem angelka and, and angel mai, and the stem will be the same in the perfect and the pluperfect. The endings will be different, so that's how you can tell. Um, the, there are also contract verbs in this list. There's axiao, de lao, um, and uh, telo tao, some other contract verbs. These, the first two are Omicron contract verbs, one of the important things in this lesson. And de la o and axia are the Omicron contract verbs. Their principal parts, I think, are easy to, to um, learn, worth learning. Again, you have the lengthening of the contracted vowel, the Omicron to an omega outside of the present system. And that, that's a, p a feature of all the principal parts are outside of the present one. The verb axiao comes from the adjective axios, that means worthy, axios, axia, axio, axion, that means worthy or worthy of. Uh, as an adjective, it governs a genitive, so you say someone is worthy of honor or esteem or praise or money, okay? And that thing that they're worthy of goes in the genitive case, just like you would expect from worthy of whatever it is in English. So the verb can mean consider someone worthy of something, and that the thing that they are worthy of will go in the genitive case. Um, the verb de lao, make clear or show, is a very common uh, a verb in ancient Greek. Um, means, means to clarify or show or reveal something. 
um, then la the last contract verb in the lesson is in the third from the last item on the second page, the derivative of the noun telos, which is teleltao, to complete or bring to an end something. So it's an alpha contract verb, has the standard principal parts of an alpha contract verb, and it means it comes from the noun teleote, which means completion or end, and, and uh, which itself is derived from telos. So there's an intermediary step that the book isn't showing you. Um, the book in this lesson undertakes a new convention, which is to give you the definitions of preverbs. Preverbs are uh, what you know of as prepositions, um, but they they were originally little adverbs that came at the beginning of sentences in Indo-European, and they be turned into two things. On the one hand, they became prepositions, which governed a, no a noun object. On the other hand, they became preverbs, that is, adverbs associated with a verb. So what this dictionary definition of the preverbs is, as you see for apa, the fifth word in the list, and a little bit farther down, ek and x, is a kind of way of trying to, to help you to guess what the compounded form of a verb means when it's preceded by apa or ek. Notice that they give you for apa what you would be able to guess. That is, as a preverb, it means away from. So uh, for, with a verb like felgo, you say apa felgo, it means flee from someone. Um, that's predictable enough, but there's another meaning that the book doesn't give you, which is worthwhile knowing about, and that is the sense of back. In other words, this preverb is like the prefix re in English. Apa with didome means to give something back to someone. We don't even have the verb didome. The verb didome means give. Um, so, but it, it frequently has the function of uh, the preverb uh, re in English. Note also for ek, you expect the out of meaning, but the function, the second function, which is very common, means th the thoroughly function of it in compounding, is very common. So, so you, if you if you uh, love somebody, um, you would say, you would use the verb phileo. If you ek phileo, you love them to death. Okay, it's a way of of of, uh, of ratcheting up the intensity of the verbal action. Other things in this lesson, um, you have a whole set of stem nouns that are learned and adjectives that, that are the subject of this, or one of the subjects of this lesson. So you have the stem adjective alethes, alethes, again a two-gender two adjective, one masculine and feminine, and the other neuter, um, and the inflection is something you learn. This means true or real or genuine is another way of translating it. Um, those are slightly different concepts in English, and aletheis can mean all of them. And then derived from it, the adjective aletheis is the noun aletheia, which means truth. Does, reality is a, a, a little bit tricky. There are other ways to say reality in Greek, but it means uh, genuineness, okay, in that sense. Um, there's also the noun genos genus ta. These, that's a noun that looks like a logos type noun. But notice that it's neuter, so it can't be because logos type nouns are always masculine or feminine and never neuter. So genos genus ta, okay, note the s in the genitive is one of these stem um, neuter nouns. From it, they teach you the adjective el genes, well born, where you get the name Eugene in English. A little bit farther down, there's the noun pathos, pathus, which is actually an English word all by itself. It means suffering uh, of the same type as genos. Um, and then there's, at the ver near the end of the vocabulary, there's telos, telus, which means end. Um, it means end in the sense of completion, okay, not just when something stops. Um, and so uh, that, that's why it has this function power because it, it has the same function as the word end and in the sense of the end of something, in the sense of the goal of something, right? It means, it means goal uh, or completion rather than limit. So it can mean the, the essence of something, its power. Um, you also have it, it can be an, a word that means uh, an initiation rite, a ritual uh, with a goal. Um, very complicated word with a lot of interesting meanings to it. 
Um, the other the, the other types of noun that this lesson teaches you are exemplified in the vocabulary. They're the kinship terms. They are andros. It tells you that it means man, um, which is de deceptive. It means male human being, and it also means husband. Okay, um, man in English um, is the opposite of woman, and that's what it means. And just as the word for woman, gune, can mean wife, so aner, andros, can mean husband. Um, it, but it doesn't mean man with a capital M. The word for human being in Greek, as you know, is anthropos. The, you also have thugater, uh, a little bit farther down. The word for daughter, which actually, actually is cognate with the English word daughter. These words have, have slightly different inflections from what you're used to because there are stem changes. But the endings are the predictable ones of the third declension. Um, finally, you also have, uh, secondly, you have um, meter, the word for mother, and pater, the word for father, which are also inflected in similar ways that are slightly different from what you expect, again, with similar case endings, however. Um, one, one, uh, and then there's, there, then there is a third type, that is, the IS nouns of the third declension, nouns of the type polis. So you have polis poleos, the accent no, no, you notice on the first of three syllables, even though os is long, because originally that was poleos, with an eta and an omicron, and then you got a flipping of the vowels. Already the accent had been established in that position before the vowels changed. So there's polis. There's also physis, which means nature in the sense of the opposite of culture, okay, uh, or what makes what makes something grow. The verb fool, from which, which physis de derives, means sprout, okay. You know, it means the essence of something. It means nature as a natural force. Um, it has a complex set of significances. Um, the there's also, they give you the noun Socrates, okay, which is like the noun, the name Demosthenes. These are two nouns whose nominative ends in es. Previously, you've had nouns ending in es that are of the type stratiotes, that is, masculine nouns of the first declension. So stratiotes, stratiotu, and so forth, which has feminine endings. But notice Demosthenes and the, the genitive is demosthenus. In other words, it's an stem masculine noun. The the only masculine nouns of the of this variety that are, remain are name, are personal names. So nouns of the type genos are neuter. Nouns of the type demosthenes are stem nouns that are masculine. And notice, since they're names, they only have singular. So there's Socrates, Socratus, demosthenes, demosthenus. The endings are like the endings of Genos, but since genos is neuter, the nominative and the accusative are the same, whereas Socrate and Demosthene, with a circumflex over the eta, are the accusative endings. Um, I think you also learn the, uh, the there are some other adjectives in this lesson, aside from, um, uh, oh yes, then there's a, a last type of noun, that is nouns of the, it was non, nominative singular ends in else, masculine nouns of the third declension of the type basileus. You also have hieraus, the word for priest. Basileus means king, hieraus means a priest. You also have hippaus, which means a horseman. Um, and I think that's it in this lesson. Uh, the inflection of those is covered in the book. You also have adjectives of the type eudaimon, that's a third declension adjective. Notice the accent of the neuter is eudaimon, because the last syllable is short. The accent actually moves up a syllable, uh, can be on the third to last syllable. So eudaimon doesn't follow the normal rules of accent in which the nominative singular masculine sets the precedent for the persistence of accents. That's a peculiar feature of it. Um, there's also sophron of the same type, sophron, again exhibiting this funny accent rule um, because you get a circumflex in the in the neuter form, except there's all, it's only a two-syllable two adjective, so the accent doesn't go farther back. Um, I think that's pretty much it. You also have namos, an important concept in Greek, the custom of the word for custom. It translates it law. I think it's probably better to think of uh, Greek law is what uh, legal experts call customary law. In other words, it's non-professionalized law. 
Um, so it's better to think of namas as meaning custom, and I think then you'll understand its usage is better. Um, okay, I think that's it.